So we have for this episode our our good friend that we've never talked to directly before. Never met in person. <laughs> never met in person. What an intro. So sad. Mr. Brandon Campbell Diamond. Hey guys. A legend. I've been talking about you a lot recently. I don't know why, and not to be creepy. Um, Too late. We, I just get bored, all right? I'm bored. I'm, I'm live streaming on Twitch for 12 hours a day, and uh, there's a lot of fitness fans in there. And so we'll, conversation will come up about OGs or where the YouTube game is now or whatever, and your name's always brought up as, as just just an original that put out good content that's real that's that has solid advice that doesn't overstep his bounds yeah. like it's so easy to be like a good content creator like just don't 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 talk about things you don't know right mm -hmm. like just just like give solid advice that you're well aware of and you can reference either experts or articles on like it's so simple check, check a um check a frequency box that you know you can live up to yeah consistency of content yeah consistency of content uh and it's so simple and so you got a lot of fans out there i guess was what it breaks down to i'm a fan we're all fans yep but some of your content i guess from the very beginning has switched a little bit yeah i mean i guess i guess it's really similar to your guys show right you talk about what you know and when you don't know something you let someone else who's usually more informed than easy. you talk about it and fill you in fill in the gaps right yeah, easy, easy. But in the beginning, it was more like a kind of training vlog. Um, yeah, well, it's interesting. I got, I got into YouTube specifically through the bodybuilding.com forums, which forums were used to be a thing back then. So you, that kind of dates when this kind of started and kicked off. <laughs> and I uh, initially started posting supplement reviews because I wanted to basically have companies send me stuff. And a lot of people were just logging it via the forum. And I thought, hey, you bring in a audiovisual aspect to it. More people will probably watch it because that's when YouTube was really getting kicked off. Yeah. And I figured like, when I want to know something, what do I do? I YouTube it. So I started doing that. And then that led to people saying, oh, well, what are you doing for training? What are you doing for nutrition? And then I got to that point where the YouTube fitness space got very saturated with people who just were kind of talking out their rear ends. And I had to kind of switch gears a little bit because there's a lot better people putting out smarter and a lot of more evidence-based stuff than I was at the time. So I kind of stopped doing that and I started talking more equipment stuff. That's kind of where my, my passion has lied. Now I still just basically do some training, but I just talk about equipment and try to give my perspective because obviously anytime you're buying gym equipment, it's not usually something you can go in the store and get your hands on. If you're spending several thousands of dollars on things that weigh several hundred pounds, there's a good chance you're not going to be able to return it or go through the steps or costs in order to do so. So I just try to give people kind of that feedback of, hey, this is what it is. This is what's good about it. This is what isn't good about it. And this is why you, why you shouldn't necessarily consider it. We'll dig into maybe some of your advice on that equipment. That's kind of what this episode's based around um, because everything's freaking sold out for one. Yeah. Everyone's freaking out that, that they might lose a, a, a 50 pounds on their squat. They're acting like the world's ending. But uh, what I'm more interested in is, is, are you like interested in equipment? Now, I, uh, to not get sad, the only thing I've found as an adult here that really gives me fulfillment or joy, the only thing is when I get like a deal. When I get one up on someone else, I feel so good. So like to buy my car, it took me like 10 months because I needed to get a good deal. To buy my house, it took three and a half years <laughs> of hunting the market because I needed to get this deal. And so I haven't made a home gym, but I know if I did, I would probably get into the nuts and bolts like what you do just because I want that deal. I want the best thing at the best price mm. that's most efficient. And it, I, I don't drive a Rolls Royce. It's just that I want to get the most bang for my buck compared to everybody else in the world. Yeah. I want to win. Right. I think a lot of that is there comes with trade-offs, right? And I mean, it's like any hobby. You initially get into it because you like it. And the more you get into the weeds, the more nerdy you get into it with any hobby, almost probably to the point where you become a little bit overloaded. Then you kind of take your foot off the gas a little bit, but there's always trade-offs. I mean, it depends on what you're looking for. Yes. You can get good bang for your buck from a lot of stuff out there, but some of the trade-offs might be in the quality of the equipment, maybe the footprint it takes up, maybe the customer service that you're gonna be dealing with, You know, the hassle of actually getting someone on the phone and talking to them. So I think there's always trade-offs, but that being said, if you're in the market for getting deals and you are in the selling market right now, obviously you said everybody's sold out. So the secondhand market, which I think Alan talked a lot about in his, uh, his call with you guys a year ago, 
it's ridiculous the pricing that some people are charging and actually getting for a lot of stuff right now. Yeah, I was casually, uh, again, on Twitch with my buddy. He lives in uh, Houston. He's in the chat. Shout out to Bibby. And Bibby's like, man, Mike, you want to like help me find a squat rack? I'm like, yeah, man, I'm streaming for 12 hours. We'll do it live on the internet. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I hop on Craigslist Houston, and there's like a, I'm pretty sure it's like the most rusted rack, the the shelf racks where it's kind of like. Oh, the um, pyramid style ones? Yeah, yeah. kind of like a pyramid style, old school commercial rack, rusted to the bone. Like I wouldn't put 135 on this thing. <laughs> and they're charging like three grand or something, and what? it's in someone's backyard. I'm like. Where do you even think that's like even close? You know, yeah. like what the hell is going on? Yeah, I don't, I don't understand that. I know people are making uh, concrete weights now, like yeah. the real flashback, or uh, four uh, 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 squat racks out of four by four wood. Yeah, wood yeah. Squat racks. I've seen a lot of wood squat racks. That scares me. All of it scares me. I'll just skip fat. I'll <laughs> skip. I'll skip all this. I don't care. Too late. We already did yeah, that. I don't care. I think it goes back to what you're saying, right? It's everybody's sold out and everyone's worried they're going to lose their gains. Like who knows when gyms are going to reopen. So people are kind of desperate. And when the supply is low and demand is high, that kind of the market will dictate itself. Yeah, so. it's true. It's true. But you, you have squat racks to feed the world. How many do you have? How many? <laughs> your whole basement looks like a full gym now. Yeah, I'm down to. So we're renting right now because we're building a house. And like, it, it's, it's odd that one of my main concerns with building a house is I wanted a nine foot ceiling in my basement specifically for the gym. And the rest of the house, I was like, my wife, you have carte blanche on the <laughs> now. But like, even now, I'm like, I'm in a small little garage and I bought a specific setup for this garage because I think that gets into, again, what you were saying before about, you know, the pros and cons, getting a good deal. I think also you have to build for the space that you have and what you want to get out of it. That's going to dictate a lot of, you know, the cost and the footprint and things like that. So, do you feel like when you make these decisions, it's it's really around this meeting the space plus your own like aesthetic or 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 sense of how things should function, or is it company reputation first, or like where do you start? Well, I mean, I'd like to say it's company reputation. A lot of my stuff is rogue, which I think for the most part offers a really high quality compared to the price. And I say that because a lot of their stuff could be considered commercial grade, whereas you start getting into some of the legacy commercial grade equipment, like, you know, hammer strength and stuff like that. And you're looking at ridiculous prices, but because people think it's going in a home, they think it should be cheap and affordable, like something you'd get at Walmart. And again, there's definitely trade-offs in what you get. For me though, I think it comes down to usually three main things. Price for me is probably one of the most prominent things that I think about but also how much footprint it takes up. So again, right now in the garage that I'm in, which is a multi-purpose use, if I could flip the camera around, you'd see lawn mowers, gas cans, kid toys, all sorts of stuff. Mm. Uh, so footprint something takes up. Usually, you know, if you're gonna get something that takes up a massive footprint, it might be ideal because you can get a lot away with it, but it's not gonna be ideal in terms of where you're putting it. So the last thing I also look at, so price, footprint, and then also usability. So obviously you can get stuff that you can use for just more than one purpose. So you probably don't want to go out and buy a pet deck for your gym, even though you really, really want to <laughs> use some flies and stuff, but it doesn't make sense because the price is probably going to be really high. It's going to take up a high footprint and the usability on that's probably pretty low. Yeah. It seems like the old school way. And I think what you have, is just like a squat rack, a, a squat cage, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I've seen more people and it maybe it's because it's more, uh, the niche that I follow are power lifters specifically. Uh, a lot of guys are going with like a, uh, I don't even know what it's called. Not a utility rack. I only had one cup of coffee today. Bear with me folks. <laughs> Bear with my brain. Like a combo rack? Yeah, combo rack. Combo rack. Go, yeah. More people are just going with the combo rack, which I would assume takes up a little bit less uh, footprint than a squat rack. Um, but you can't do, like you said, usability. You might not be able to do rack poles or some other stuff in there. Um, talk about the first piece right i think that's where we're at it's kind of a squat rack or maybe 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 you're a bro and maybe you just want a bench i don't know um i think i go i think i go squat rack but teach yeah, us so i think for most people a squat rack would probably make most sense because i mean you can do a bunch of stuff the main compounds with it and you have a place to put your barbell i think a step up from there would probably be a full cage because you get kind of the added benefits of you know safety which especially during this time when you shouldn't be training with other people yeah. uh, you, want, like, you know full-on cage versus just some spotter arms or whatnot but then you open up the whole world of attachments and i think to your point with the combo racks it's really good if you're a power lifter because you can squat and bench in it and you don't need anything to deadlift in but the downside of that is you can't add any attachments for the most part you shouldn't be failing in an actual combo rack you should have people spotting you which yeah. again in this time isn't really uh a good way to do it. And I think a lot of people are actually going combo racks now strictly because they're some of the only things still in stock. And even though they, they take up a very small footprint and they have low usability, 
the price point's extremely high. So, I mean, you get a good combo rack from like Alico, ER, uh, Elite FTS. You're looking at probably like after shipping, like almost three grand just for that. But I think it's, again, a testament to the times where people are willing to pay whatever, and maybe they don't have a space set up for a home gym and they're forced to have a home gym, that that's why they're choosing to go that route. Yeah, no chin-ups, like you said. Like, that's a basic that I go to. Like, it, everyone says, Mike, what exercises are you doing? Well, first off, I'm doing none. But if I were to do them, it would be <laughs> like squat, bench, dead, row, or chin-up. Um, right. and, and if you don't have – you can't do – you already eliminate, like, one or two if you just go combo rack mm-hmm. over a squat rack. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, I, I think ahead. for most people, like anything where you can rack a barbell, because obviously that gives you a lot of options, and even some of the adjustable dumbbells that are on the market, before the whole price increase, I mean, if you get an adjustable dumbbell that goes up from anywhere to like five to 100 pounds, which isn't actually that expensive in a normal market, I mean, you can get away with a lot of stuff. I think where it's really hard is for people who typically train for a uh, like bodybuilding style, where they're used to a bunch of accessories, where you'd use cables and things like that, mm. that a home gym doesn't usually make as much sense. and they'll typically find that they can't stick to it and they would rather go to a gym given an opportunity. Yeah, I even want to push back on that. I think it's the the bodybuilders that think they're bodybuilders. <laughs> you know, like, well, because if you follow our boys like like Alberto Nunez or Eric Helms, like Eric Helms looks like he's working out harder than I've ever seen him. He's doing one leg sissy squat upside yeah. down. In a, in a parking garage. I don't know what he's doing, but he looks like he's putting himself through torture. So uh, another thing with usability of the, uh, of the rack is just general knowledge, right? Like what what exercise knowledge do you have? And what experience and a, just a hair of creativity. You can mm. kind of do anything with some bands and, like you said, adjustable dumbbells yeah. opposed to your fancy pec deck. Right. So th- this brings up a question to me that I was going to say for later, but it, <clears throat> it just seems like as good a time as any. You work out alone and you've made that choice because it fits your lifestyle best. A lot of people are suddenly working out at home who were working out in gyms before. Are people going to go back to gyms after this is over or are they all going to stick at home? Is there going to be a giant garage sale of all this equipment that people just bought, which awesome. um, But, uh, or is it going to be, yeah, uh, it's a good question. I've thought about the same thing and and I had discussions with people and, and some people like, of course they're going to go back environment and equipment. I'm like, bro, equipment's not that expensive. Once you've trained alone, I've done it. I I had a training facility, a personal training facility in like 2009 and I would just train by myself in a little, like basically storage unit, Mm -hmm. plus what music I want kind of felt good. A little bit of self time meditating time. And even now I'll go to, um, untamed strength sometimes, but like I'm kind of training alone. There's Mm -hmm. people around, but it's much different than like a real team environment, which I've been a part of also. Um, which feels good also, but with money, with people's fear of germs, like who knows? Yeah, I think uh, I think for the most part, it's probably going to be a mix of both, both, right? So there's definitely going to be people who can't wait to go back to the gym, especially when we talk about those who typically do a lot of accessories or can't get access to the equipment or machines that they'd want to use. So that's one of the things that I've talked about in some of my other videos is one of the reasons I like training at home so much is because there's everything that I need in my home and it's typically exactly what I wanted. So it's like you just go out and you buy a cheap dumbbell set, a cheap barbell and some crappy weights and your gym has better stuff than what you have at home. You're more likely to go to the gym when when you have that opportunity. But I do think there's definitely going to be a subset of people who just never gave training at home a, a chance. And now that they're forced to, they're going to see that they actually really like it. And from my perspective, one of the biggest benefits is just the time management aspect. Yeah. So like if you need to travel, I don't know how far, for example, Mike, you mentioned Untamed Strength. I know it's generally in the Sacramento area. I don't know how far that is from yeah. you. Yeah, it's like 25 minutes. So if you figure almost an hour round trip, yeah. and if you go there, let's say four to five days a week, if you're a full-time member, that's five hours a week, that ends up to be like a couple of days out of the year that you're just spending traveling versus you can come and train whenever, the gym's always open. If you have uh, kids and a wife or uh, you work from home like I do, it makes everything so much more easy because I never miss the gym because it isn't open or I don't feel like driving. So there's definitely a trade-off, but again, it really comes down to that individual and really what they hold as important in terms of their own. Yeah, I think you're so right. There's pros and cons to both sides because like um, I see both and I've I've even contemplated myself building a home gym. I was like the convenience of it being in the basement of the garage seems great. I can work out any time. I can set my schedule, never have to wait for a squat rack. But then there's also something with me and maybe it's because I started training and like 
eighth grade or whatever, and I'm used to driving about half an hour for a good gym, or I used to have a strength coach and I would drive to him. There's something also about that drive where I'd listen to music, drink my caffeine mm-hmm. and get in a mindset to go work out and like go to it that I was like, well, if it's in my garage, I'm not going to the garage. Like it's cold out there. <laughs> yeah. You know, like I, I don't got my music. What am I just going to walk down there in my boxers and start squatting? <laughs> like it's a different vibe. And then counter to that, um, I do get some of my best workouts totally alone uh, with the music, like I mentioned before, but some people I think, we're all three of us and probably a lot of our listeners too are just so like we're so stuck in this niche like we're all just like meatheads you know so like we're gone we're off the deep end of this thing but there's a lot of people that go to the gym for social hour for community to meet people i've never really been one because i just don't like humans but a lot of people really enjoy company and chatting and spotters and loaders and blah 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 blah, even coaches or whatever Mm. i don't like any of that but i think a a large majority of 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 general population even that tip towards powerlifting probably will enjoy that i think that um once you know we're able to actually like be freely outside again i think there's going to be a great impulse to want to get the hell out of the house too yeah and so yeah maybe and in as you said some people are very dependent upon environment and particularly like the, the hype of people around you and anybody who's um who's lifting in gear yeah you need to be around people. I mean, there are people who do it without it. And there are a couple of, of good examples, you know, um, Blaine. Yeah. And Mike to Yeah. He's but a they're more raw now, but they're the exception and not, not the rule. Yeah. 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 yeah I think, uh, Bryce Krawcheck, I think he's just, uh, training raw for now, but he's at home. Yeah. You know, smashing out weights. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I think part of the thing that can definitely help though too is like anything, even if you're working from home, usually if you have like some sort of defined space that you know that that's what that area is for. Like obviously right now with the podcast where you guys were set up, if you were doing this on your living room couch, yeah. you know, people walking in and out like your wife or whatever gym or other distractions, you know, obviously it's not going to be a, a, a great spot to consistently train. You're probably not going to be as motivated. So I usually try to tell people, you know, make sure you have a defined area and you know that when you're going to go in there, you can go in there because obviously there's a lot more distractions at home. You know, you can walk to the fridge and get a sandwich. You can stay on your phone as long as you want. No one's going to be waiting for that squat rack or bench. Right. I, th- I think there are things you can do proactively to make sure that you're setting yourself up best for um, success. Yeah. It seems like Rogue kind of did switch that game up a little bit. And um, obviously YouTube, powerlifting, whole nother discussion uh, that I actually had with a pretty cool crew of, of Omar, Johnny Candido, Alan, all those guys. We talked about like the history of, of, of YouTube powerlifting kind of or where powerlifting is mm. now and how it kind of got here. But it seems like Rogue played a huge impact on, like you said, kind of affordability for someone uh, who's serious about what they do um, that doesn't want the Walmart rack. Um, because even now, like how many real powerlifting gyms are there in our nation? Not that many, really. Like More than there used to be. For sure. There used to just be like three. But yeah. now, <laughs> so now there's some. Um, but it seems like Rogue kind of changed the game. And, and I guess it's cool and kind of whatever that you said that there, you think their stuff right, really is that good. And I, I agree. I've used a lot of their stuff. I'm not as analytical about it probably as, as you are, Brandon. But um, their stuff's really good pretty damn affordable um and it is like commercial grade like the, it's heavy as metal where i remember trying to, again trying to open up a studio at age 20 with like five grand that i had from djing my whole high school career trying to put pieces together and i'm buying piece of shit racks uh-huh. just piece and they're commercial grade they're out of like a, a gold's gym in san francisco i bought a rack and it's a piece of shit and they're charging me like a grand used you know and it's like one by two two being like just crap you know so I guess shout out to them, but everybody already knows what they're doing, so they don't care about my shout out. But it's, yeah. well, it's interesting now because you take a look at like Walmart, and one of Walmart's brands for fitness equipment is Gold's Gym branded stuff. So it's like the, uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the bottom line, they also carry stuff like Titan, which a lot of people compare Rogue to because Titan just goes out and clones people. And if you want something that's imported and stuff that maybe isn't as consistent across the board in terms of quality, then you can get that. But I, I like to. Is I it the same people, Titan that makes wraps? No. Different so Titan, uh, right? Different company. Uh, yeah, different company. So this is uh, – Titan is a company based out of Tennessee that actually uh, got into the game from selling farm equipment and just one day decided to start making fitness equipment as well, which if you use any of their version one of anything, you could probably understand why they sold farm equipment before because a lot of it's really crappy. But what they typically do is they find something that's successful, 
export it overseas to China and make a cheaper version of it. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people, that's okay. I mean, I use, I get a lot of flack on my channel when I highlight some of the stuff that's more expensive, like some of the bars, some of the equipment, because not everybody is as invested. They just want something basic and something simple. Sure. But I usually like to use a, a car analogy. So like you can get a cheap car, a beater car, you know, a Honda Civic from 10 years ago, that's going to get you from point A to point B. And if that's all you're interested, that's fine. But if you're into cars and you want something with more performance or more luxury features or you want the uh, experience or something, if you will. We're going least, German, uh, baby. We're going German. <laughs> exactly right. You still have your uh, your your E-Series out there? Your... Yeah, it's just sitting on my mom's. It doesn't work. Yeah. I mean, it works, but it doesn't work. And now i got no money to put into it. One day it'll <laughs> – she'll shine again. <laughs> she'll shine again. So what what are the, like, hallmarks of quality to you in terms of equipment builds? Yeah, I, I think one of the easiest things to tell if you're looking at racks is just the welds. I mean, you take a look at a weld, and you even if you don't know anything about welding, which I don't necessarily, you can tell a good weld from a bad weld, especially when you're comparing apples to apples and looking at both of them. Obviously, for a lot of people, when I get comments from people saying, oh, you know, this product is just as good and it's cheaper, it's because they don't have experience with the other end of the spectrum. So it's like you don't know what you don't know. Uh, I think a big thing though is consistency across the line. So you could go with a cheaper barbell and you might have a great copy of one, but for every great copy, there's also a bad copy out there. Maybe the knurling isn't consistent. Maybe the sleeves don't spin. Uh, I've seen a lot of that. So it's just a matter of consistency and then also the customer service aspect. So if there's a problem, are they gonna fix it for you? How's their shipping? More importantly, there's a bunch of horror stories. You order something from some of these less expensive brands and one of the things that you're paying less money for is their shipping, which tends to be in very low quality cardboard tubing. It's not packed very well. So you might've just spent a couple hundred bucks on a piece of equipment only to find that it's banged up, bent, missing pieces, all sorts of stuff. And it's just such a headache to get that replaced or right. So it's a matter of, do you want to pay less and go with more headaches? Or would you rather just pay a little bit more and get that peace of mind knowing that it's a more simplified and easier process on your end? Um. I don't want. I don't want to put this in 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 a way that is going to make it difficult to answer. But <clears throat> are there specific brands that you evaluated the equipment and said, "No, nope. I was going to put that. I was going to have the same question. What are like top three brands you looked to that you yeah trust? Yeah, we, we know Rogue, but and, and then and then if you you don't necessarily have to name names, but are there sure. specific manu manufacturers in your mind that like oh, no no not, not that ever again. Yes, yeah, so uh, I'll give you some general feedback. So obviously, I, I think Rogue across the board for consistency and price is probably one of the best options for people. They probably do the most volume. When you talk about Rogue, you'll get a lot of people that will say Titan Fitness is the cheaper alternative, which oftentimes they are. They have a lot of similar products because they literally just clone out whatever they have. Um, and I think with Titan, I will recommend them in some instances. It's really based off the piece that they sell there. So some of their stuff, like their safety squat bar, is a clone of the Elite FTS safety squat bar, which is good. Uh, but then they have some other products that are out there that don't really live up to expectations. So it's a piece by piece basis for them. Also, when you talk Rogue, you oftentimes hear Sorenex. And Sorenex is known for doing a lot of stuff, being innovative in the field. However, I find that they typically tend to cater more to large facilities, colleges, high schools, professional teams. So the home market really isn't their forte. So oftentimes they're at a more price premium and their offerings, in my opinion, are very similar to Rogue, uh, but then the shipping will really kill you just because they're not as mainstream as Rogue is with the shipping price as well, but you can get a lot of good stuff from them. Elite FTS, who I believe right uh, fitness equipment make all their stuff on the back end, good, but where they are in Ohio and their shipping usually kills a lot of stuff for me, in my opinion, so they make good equipment if the shipping price is right. And then you have some other people out there that are really making some waves, in my opinion, like Rep Fitness, who are making some of their higher end racks that look very similar to some of the, the better racks we've talked about already with Rogue and Sornex and whatnot, but at a better price point because they're importing in from overseas. Um, so there, there are a lot of good companies out there and there's a lot of ones coming up as more and more people get into it. I think though, when you take a look at the low end side of the house for any manufacturer, because most manufacturers will have, you know, like their entry level stuff, their mid tier and then their high tier, if you look at the low-level stuff, especially if that company is importing things from China, 
they're just basically rebrand. So they'll be the exact same racks and they just have a different logo on it. And mm. one of the interesting things that people will bring up sometimes, if you go on a site like Alibaba and type in, you know, like glute ham rays or whatever, you'll see the exact ones that you're buying from all these companies and the prices that people are paying in bulk and it will really open up your eyes in terms of markups and whatnot. So it's, it's really kind of a, I don't want to say it's a gamble, um, but in most cases when you're paying more, it's for that experience again, where you're going to get consistency. You're going to get higher end stuff. In some cases of Rogue and Sorenex, you're getting mostly American made. Rogue still imports all their weights, to my knowledge, outside of maybe some of their high temp bumpers, which come from a, a USA company. Um, but on the lower end, it's kind of a, a free for all. So it really just depends on again what you're looking for and what you expect. I mean, you're not going to pay bottom dollar for a top tier rack. It's just not going to happen. Why do you think that is? Um... Jim and I, uh, for a project we may or may not be secretly working on, I've been paying a little bit more attention to equipment than I ever have. And uh, there's um, an insane amount of companies. I feel like that popped up out of the last two years, or maybe even the last year, where, again, showing my age, 2009, I'm looking around, and the only companies are like Lifetime Fitness, Hammer Strength. Sorenex was around, but they were literally only doing professional. I don't even know if they had like a, a, a residential type website that you could go to and buy from. They only did big facilities. Like no one was doing anything in 2009. Craigslist, and that mm. was all trash. Um, and then, and then again, Rogue, Sorenex. Some of these people started to reach out. Then there, then a couple more, a couple more. Now there's a billion. Like even if you go to, uh, you talk about Chris Duffin, right? Like he basically, I know he doesn't make racks necessarily, but he makes equipment like he makes bars and smallish, stuff, yeah. smallish. Uh, style sure. there's ghost there's rep uh, is it pr there's another one that's kind of like rep i've seen uh on instagram going around that a, a lot of people are rocking um is the demand that high you think or do you think people are just into it what what's 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 the because ladies yeah. and gentlemen this guy isn't just handsome he doesn't <laughs> just make youtube videos he isn't just strong <laughs> He knows some shit about shit. Like, this is a business man here, ladies and gentlemen. He knows what's yes. going on in the back end. So I think it's a mix of both. I think, obviously, the demand is is higher. I mean, every a lot more people are getting into fitness and especially building out their own stuff because they have access to, whereas you mentioned 10 years ago, you didn't have access to buying a lot of the higher-end equipment at an affordable price. So even though the prices are somewhat considered high on the top-tier stuff from some of those companies I mentioned, they weren't the hammer strength prices of like four grand for a squat rack brand new, things like that. So the demand is obviously there. The accessibility has increased. And also like a lot of people are now able to do outsourcing themselves. I won't name the company specifically, but I know one company that puts out decent equipment that is literally one person just ordering things from overseas and importing them and doing all the shipping and stuff like that himself. And anyone can really do that if they're willing to front the cost for the volume. Sure. So mm. I know we talked a little bit about OG fitness stuff, but remember 10 years ago, how many people were doing apparel? Not many. And those that were, were doing it through like, you know, Teespring and these yeah. other brands online versus now a lot of them have distribution that are based overseas and doing high volume and designing and stuff like that. So the markets change in terms of accessibility to people who actually want to get into it too, which I think is a big factor. Yeah, I think that that we're we're definitely um, looking at a time where uh, powerlifting has sort of peaked and is beginning to like fall off a little bit. It, what what's our just thought about how long this is going to run out? I mean, I I when I started powerlifting, there was it was not that big a deal. Yeah, uh, yeah. We, this is exact talk. Uh, shout out to my buddy, obviously Omar Isaf at me. Johnny Candido, Alan Thrall, Bryce Krawcheck. I think that was it. And we just had a roundtable kind of about that exact conversation, like some of our favorite memories from the past, when it blew up, why it blew up, how's it blowing up, where's it going in the future. Uh, I don't I don't think it's peaking. I don't think it's going to I think I think the growth has slowed down by by numbers, but I don't think it's actually peaked. Like if if we get I mean, every I remember back when I did some marketing for a company that people may know about. I I, I literally looked on Instagram and I would just say like, who, who is this? Like, cause there wasn't like branding meetings or marketing meetings or like any like f tunnel vision. Right. So I just did it myself and I, I didn't go to college for anything. I just think logically, like who fits this brand, right? Like, what does this brand do? And I said, anybody who squats fits this brand. Right. And I'm searching around Instagram and there's nobody. I'm training sometimes at a 24 hour fitness, sometimes at a powerlifting gym. No one's squatting at a 24 hour fitness. Nobody. I go back to that exact same 24 hour fitness where my mom trains or near where my mom lives, started training there, I don't know, like three years ago, a little bit. And there is three more squat racks that used to be in the gym mm -hmm. and they're full 24 seven. 
Um, and I don't think they're power lifters. I think they're just chicks and dudes that want to kind of get strong. Some of them had some SBD stuff on. Mm. Some of them had a rogue belt on or something. Um, I think that market, which I consider, I'll call it power lifting. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they compete. Maybe they compete once every two years for shits and gigs. Or just not at all. Yeah, or maybe not at all. Um, I think that market, uh, I think the, the sky's the limit. It blows my mind that kind of the plyometric typical fitspo girl is still really popular on instagram because there's so many people that have debunked that obviously um like they're and don't come after me you little twitter nerds <laughs> like yes plyometrics do have an application they're just doing it wrong um those girls are just genetically blessed and i love looking at them but i'm not taking their fitness advice uh, <laughs> i think it's like the booty always sells no yeah yeah i'm not complaining per se i'm just saying i'm not buying their ebook um but i think the general market for people squatting deadlifting um even even college coaches over the last 10 years that, uh, that i've uh, strength and conditioning coaches pro strength conditioning coaches that i've talked to trained with whatever have gotten exponentially uh, m better knowledge and experience from what was going on in the 90s and early 2000s of max out or power cleans only mm. or throw this medicine ball or we're running eight miles just because we're running eight miles like all that's kind of changed so i think it's still growing and, and and i don't know if the usapl or the uspa or what will grow but i think people bench squat deadlifting are going to grow maybe forever Slower, slower, because we peak hard. Like 2015, I don't know what the number was, but there's like 30,000 people lot, at yeah. USAPL Nationals or something stupid like that. Yeah, I agree. And I think I think part of it is too, is just the general thing with, with anything that people are invested in. At some point, there does come burnout and tendencies change. So even like for powerlifting, and I watched that, uh, that round table that you guys had, uh, Mike, the other day too, and I was listening to Johnny talk about, you know, dealing with injuries and coming back. And I think for some of it on the, the more competitive end, the people that are making a lot of the content that people see, people get burnt out, whether it's because it's injury, maybe it's because of lack of progress, whatever the case is, or maybe it's just something that they're more interested. So I've seen a lot of people go to the, the jujitsu route, you know, it's something, yeah. just another way to kind of get their athleticism out and their competitiveness out. And maybe they find an avenue where they can kind of scratch that itch versus if they've been doing something for a long time where it gets a little bit dull or stale and they're looking to spice it up. I think that like a serious competitive powerlifting career is, you know, this long. It's short. Yeah. It's, you know, you, you injuries and then just the, if you're going to be any good, you really, really have to commit to it. That if you're going to be just a, like a weekend warrior lifter, you can do that forever, I guess. Yeah, and even that, even a weekend warrior, if you're pushing yourself, it's hard. And that's we didn't really touch on it in that round table, but like, because I think Johnny was talking about like you need ten years in the sport to be really, really good. I'm not going to disagree there. And he's like, some of these young guns are crushing and they're at the top, and they've only trained for two to five years. Yeah, hard powerlifting, but that's because the genetic pool and the, the talent pool has grown. And I do agree with that too. But what I disagree with is like, like you just said, the mental burnout and the physical burnout. We don't really know when anyone's peaked because like no one has, <laughs> you know, like whether you want to go the untested route or the tested route, like, yeah, like Bryce Lewis and people have been in the game a really long time and he's, he's still making really good progress and he's obviously strong as shit, but, um, and he's been in it about 10 years, but like other than Bryce Lewis, like, I don't, you know, there's not a lot of names running around that have been going hard like him for 10 years plus. Um, and I just don't think it's going to be that common. It's not like the NBA. You can't Blaine Sumner. Yeah. Blaine's been around a long time. Um, it's just it's just uncommon, but I mean, of like the genetic freaks or the yeah. whatever, like even a Dan Green, like he he's been training for ten years, sure, but like he hasn't been like Mister Competitive for ten years. Um, I don't know, I don't know, but personally, sadly, I don't really care that much anymore. <laughs> like if you crush big numbers, that's cool. Uh, shout out to Johnny and, and Bryce and those guys that go so hard. I do respect it beyond belief because I I did it for a long time, um, and I still do. Uh, I was about to try to crush some numbers, but it's hard. It's it's hard mentally. It's not always fun. Um, and, and that's kind of where the round table ended is like, we need kind of money. We need some organization, which we've all talked about for millions of years, how many federations there are, how there's no upside to really taking it as a full-time mm -hmm. athlete. Um, and so why, why would you, uh, unless you're a little psycho, which is probably true. I wanted to go back to equipment real quick because there's something I know nothing about Brandon and I've seen you talk and post about is knurling. You guys are talking about knurling like it's fucking Picasso's paintings. <laughs> you, you got the squiggle versus the straight line. You got different terms for all this. First off, what nerd came up with a fucking knurling name? I want to know who does that. And is it is it like tied into some machinery past stuff? I know you know about knurling, buddy. Teach me. 
Yeah, I mean, that, that's the basic of it. I mean, you, you listen to Mark Ripito, what does he say? It's like the barbell is your connection to the weights. And in that case, the knurling is your connection to the barbell. I mean, you see people using chalk and especially when you get into powerlifting, like when you're talking about, you know, have a heavy squat on your back, you don't want that falling. Talk about deadlifts, where is it missed the most and the grip portion of it. So anything you can do to help make sure that that barbell stays in your hand, that's what it's really important. And one of the things you'll find is a lot of times on gym bars or the cheaper bars, the knurling, the grip isn't very aggressive. I mean, and it's hard to hold on to those bars, whether your hands are sweaty or whatever the case may be. And the mark usually of a good bar, especially a powerlifting bar and a power bar is an aggressive or grippy knurl. Cause then you can get into the weeds of, do you want something that's shaped like a volcano and very pointy and digs into your hands? <laughs> I'm sorry, a mountain. Or do you want a volcano where it's raised up, but then has a big crater in it. So there's more surface area and then it's thus more grippy. So there's different preferences out there, but Usually a, a sign of a better barbell is a better knurl on it and a more consistent one. I have a lot of cheap bars that are decent, but going from left to right on the shaft, which sounds really dirty, you'll find that the knurling is consistent. Some's deeper and harder and the other ones are not so much, a little bit softer. And who Whoa. wants that on a bar you're spending potentially a couple hundred dollars on? I mean, you talk to people who are investing in a barbell and you tell them that a decent bar starts around 300 bucks. They tell you that they could get a barbell and weights at Walmart for 150. So right. it really just depends. Right. I know I've used bars that basically felt like cheese graters. Yeah. They yeah. would just tear you up and they would, they tore up equipment too. Competition, um, uh, a Laco weightlifting bar. That's one of the gnarliest things I've ever messed with. And then what was the big squat bar? Uh, which one? The Mas uh, not Mastodon. Mastodon. No, I don't no, think the, the other Bulldog. One. Uh, Bulldog? Iron Wolf one. That was Iron, Iron Wolf. Wolf. An Iron Wolf bar. I, I it feels saw that. like a tortured stripper pole, <laughs> just uh, just on your back. I, I I think I bled everything, ripped my shirts up and shit. Yeah. That was the gnarliest yeah, thing it, I've ever messed with. It tore J cups and you know on monoliths and yeah. you see like divots from moving the thing back and forth. That was painful. Yeah, it's like a file. Yeah, and it comes down to personal preference and what you want too, because that open also opens up a whole nother door about finishes on bars, right? So a lot of people are into Cerakote, which are fancy colors and coatings, kind of like you'd find on a lot of guns these days, which are something else a lot of people are into shooting and whatnot. You have stainless steel, you have zinc, you have chrome, you have black phosphate. And depending on what kind of finish you get on the bar is going to affect the cost, but also the feel of the neural. Because if you're getting something that's basically an application layer over that knurling, if you have really aggressive neural to start on a bare steel bar, you could potentially dull it. So there's that question to bring in. And then if you want like a really good feel on a bare steel bar, you have to think about, is it gonna oxidize and rust in the environment you're training in? Is it worth it having to go down and scrub it with an oil and brush every week or so to make sure that it's not rusting on you? So there's a, a you can get pretty nerdy with a lot of this stuff. What's Campbell Fitness favorite neural encoding? Ooh. Yeah, so uh, coating I actually don't like. I, I would prefer a bare steel or stainless steel bar. The biggest trade-off there is stainless steel is a lot more expensive. So where bare steel is probably the cheapest bar you can buy, the stainless is probably the most expensive. It also has a little bit of limitation on tensile strength. So basically how much force that bar can take before it's permanently deformed. So if you're doing rack pulls, then a low tensile strength bar probably isn't good for you. Um, so I tend to avoid coatings and finishes outside of, like I said, just a bare steel or stainless steel. Stainless steel when possible, obviously, even though it's more expensive because the maintenance and upkeep on those is very, very low. In terms of neural, it depends on the application of what I'm using it for, but if I had to just pick one, not to sound like a rogue fanboy, I think that they have a very good neural on their Ohio Power Bar because it's a volcano-like, so it's not going to necessarily cut you up, whereas something like a Texas Power Bar might um, a Kabuki strength power bar might as theirs are more mountainous. So it really mm -hmm. just depends on your own personal preference. I, I like to think I have somewhat thick skin. I haven't really had bars tear me up too much, but I know a lot of people that even think like uh, an Ohio power bar is extremely aggressive. So it just depends. Ed Cohn had a spot on his trap that wouldn't heal because of squatting with bars and I don't know how aggressive those bars were um, like the iron wolf bar. I mean, I know he was never using one of those because they were not legal in the, where he, he um, was competing, but though those were made sp pretty much specifically for, for multiply geared right. power lifters because it wasn't actually sitting on your skin for the most part. Right. It was sitting on um, this thick polyester straps. 
Um, zero whip. Same with the Mastodon. Yeah. Zero whip. That's yeah. something I guess we haven't talked about, and it probably relates to tensile strength a little bit, but whip in a bar, uh, obviously much more common in weightlifting. But yeah, Mastodon, or like a, a Texas squat bar, which was really popular five years ago and probably sits somewhere in the middle of popularity now, that'll still whip. That thing's thick, pretty good neural, but that thing will still whip on you. I'll put four plates on it, and you can kind of feel it. Or a Mastodon or the Iron Wolf, like... It's a 600 something reverse band. The thing's not whipping. Yeah. It's a very different feel about it. And again, this is all kind of nerdy talk because if you're just learning how to squat or you're, you know, squatting 315 and you just kind of want to build your quads, none of this really matters. Um, but if you've been squatting for three, five, 10 years, you'll start to notice every single bar uh, and how it kind of feels. Yeah. The funny thing is, is I've actually seen a huge uptick in squat bars like for home use, which is funny because when I think of squat bar, I think, of, you know, like, multiply people listening gear mm-hmm. um, it's huge guys who take these really huge grips out wide but the thing is now because rogue's been so popular with people one of the things that people don't realize is their racks are about 49 inches wide which is on average about two inches wider than a lot of the other competition so an inch on either side so when people are loading up plates they tend to bump the uprights yeah. when they're walking mm-hmm. out so a squat bar which is longer in that instance a lot of people look to get one of those for rogue racks just because they find that they're not bumping the uprights as much when they're walking the bar out. That makes sense. And different federations. The USPA got pretty popular in the mid uh, 210s, you know, and so the, the big boys, I think 198 and above used a squat bar, and then the ladies in 198 below used a power bar. I don't remember. Maybe they've changed yeah, that by now. Multi purpose bar. Yeah, but that's how it used to be. And so that makes sense, you know, if you're trying to be as specific as you can. But bumping your plates is one of the most annoying freaking things to ever happen on a walkout. Yeah. It really it's is. It's not good. Yeah, it's it not really good is. at all. Makes you nervous. Um, it, it, working toward a conclusion here, sort of two two final questions, um, and you can answer them in any order. What do you currently have in your setup? And then when you move to the house you're building, are you moving this setup or are you going to be doing something else? Yeah. So right now I have a Rogue RM3, which is a 30-inch deep rack. It's a four-post rack, so not a six-post with plate storage on it. Uh, On that, I have some half rack feet on the front, which I've been recommending to a lot of people because one of the things I find at home, if someone's renting, living with their parents, no judgment, um, or for whatever reason, they don't want to bolt a rack to the floor, which oftentimes is recommended, um, those half rack feet basically stabilize the rack a lot better. Uh, So I have that. I just have a deadlift platform, and I have a GHD that I got for sale from one of my buddies who was uh, consolidating his uh, commercial gym. Uh, so initially the plan was to have this just for this space because I'm in a small garage. I'm moving to basically a full basement that will be mine, have taller ceilings. And in reality, I've actually really liked this rack that I have now. And I think one of the great things about a lot of the racks that are out there and a lot of the providers is there's some expandability options. So you don't necessarily have to always be buying new racks. I could just buy two new uprights and a couple of cross members and make this a six post rack pretty easily, which I think is going to be my eventual plan. So add some plate storage maybe look at dropping in a belt squat in the rear and integrating that into the Rogue Slinger, which is basically like a a cable type attachment that you can use bands or weights on, things like that. I'll probably get some form of cardio equipment, maybe like an Airdyne bike or something like that, just so I'm not completely out of breath walking up and down the stairs to the basement. Um, And maybe get an actual dumbbell set, which up until recently I've been using an adjustable one from Iron Master that has gone anywhere from five to 120 pounds. I just have, problem of spending much too much money on things I probably don't need. So in the end, it'll be all right because it'll make good content, make good videos and good reviews. But uh, I definitely spend too much money on this stuff. But it's something that's obviously interesting to me. I got one more question. What is like the worst purchase you've made or something you'll never Ooh. buy again? Ooh. Reverse hyper, far and away. I feel Easy. like gym owners uh, would say that too. So the thing with me, the reverse hyper, I actually ended up buying a Titan one. We've talked about Titan a little bit. It's about probably half the price of what you'd get from like a West Side model through Rogue or some of the other companies now. I guess Louis patents are being able to be worked around some. Um, but that thing was literally almost the size of my six post rack in terms of footprint on the floor. Mm-hmm. And I, I find for me personally, the reverse hyper, there's a 50 50 percent chance of if you'll find it beneficial for your back. Some people swear by it and other people say they don't get anything from it. And it turns into a glorified table where you put your pre-workout and cell phone while you train. Mm hmm. And for me, it was the latter, and I ended up getting rid of that out of a, after a couple of months. And I usually just don't recommend people get it unless they know for sure that they like it and they'll use it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, from my experience as coaching and as an athlete, 
I might even switch that table a little bit and go 60, 40, 60. Just, it just doesn't feel good. It's never like felt good on my back. Maybe like one time, whatever Louis's method of my back being jammed, did I feel some relief, but every other time I've used it, and I've used it thousands of times. I've used it thousands of times um, with myself and other athletes and it just doesn't feel comfortable. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel, I could, I'd rather do some lunges or Bulgarians if I'm really trying to hit some glutes or hammies or something random. I, I right. will just say from my experience, like before I started powerlifting and I started doing this when I was over 40, which I don't recommend uh, as a starting time in your Try life. Try to start earlier. You're yeah, not you should start earlier. It. Yeah, I'm not, but I mean, you can do whatever you want and just be careful. But um, I mean, I was I was diagnosed with a couple of um, of disc bulges in my lower back before I ever started. And uh, then I immediately was going to a to a powerlifting gym that I was having to drive, you know, more than an hour one way to get to. But they had a reverse hyper and I used it and my back I have not had trouble with my back again since then. Uh, I don't have access to one right now. I think having access to one is a good thing. There are other ways to, to hit the same stuff. They're just easy. Um, but there's there are mechanical problems with them. They are not all that comfortable to use. And a lot of people don't understand how they're actually supposed to work. And so they load them up with too much weight and they're using momentum to get through the exercise. Um, from that perspective, it's not not that useful. Um, yeah, footprint, like you said, is yeah, footprint is stupid. For one yeah, function. Yeah, footprint is really stupid. It's 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 far bigger than it really needs to be. But um, I mean, some people swear by it, and the people who really like them should should use them. If I had access to one, I would use it. But what I I wouldn't. Well, I don't have any place to put a home gym. To be honest with you. We're in kind of the biggest open space in my house currently. Uh, and I certainly couldn't put anything up here, but uh, uh, no garage or anything like that. Um, I, I don't know that I would buy one if I was, you know, theoretically putting a facility together. I yeah. think I would I would tell people how to get basically the same thing. A it's the way. sprinkles on the cupcake. If you got good frosting and you got a good cake. You don't, need any you don't need any sprinkles. fucking sprinkles, but if you randomly have some sprinkles sitting around, maybe you throw some on top. Yeah. Maybe. It's in that 5% to to 1% or whatever that makes a difference for the 5% to 1% people. True. But, uh, uh, well, thank you very much for being on with us. Uh, where can people find you and your stuff? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Basement Brandon. Although I'm in the garage right now, I will be making my triumphant return in a <laughs> month or two. Sweet. And then on YouTube, you can find me under a whole lot of stuff. Brandon Campbell, Campbell Fitness, Base Barbell, probably even Basement Brandon. So if you Basement want to- Brandon, uh, look, buddy, I it just can be a little creepy. It's oh, and, and a little bargainy, too. Like oh. a bargain basement. You ever heard that? I, I just miss Campbell Fitness. I like the diamond. It sounds it sounds like a, a male stripper, you know? It sounds hard, like a, like a diamond. <laughs> Real bright. hard. Bright like a diamond. Anyway. I like the creepy factor the basement brings. My, <laughs> my wife is not a fan, which probably also contributes to the fact that I like it even more. It's yeah. It's good that you smile a lot. It's good that you're nice. And it's good that you have a kid and wife. That makes it all different. Like if it's me, I have a mullet. It's kind of greasy. <laughs> and I'm just a mullet basement mic. Yeah, it probably doesn't It probably doesn't work as well on the internet, you know? I mean, maybe it does. Maybe that's the flair I'm missing to really kind of scare people, but... Yours kind of fits. Not the creepy factor, the part I explained. The part, the fucking part I explained, all right? All right. Sign off, so Mike. Find me. Find me, Silent Mike, wherever. I don't really care. Give us a rating review. Helps a lot. Share this with your friends. Uh, new episode every single Wednesday. I appreciate you all out there, you people. I am at the Jim McD on all the social medias. The show is 50% facts where percent is a word, but 50 is not. You can find the website 50%facts.com using that same pattern. And we'll talk to you next week. Thanks again, Brandon. Easy. Thanks, guys.